Hi. Um, I'm Mark Miller, the host here to introduce Dan Ingalls. Uh, I'd like to uh, say that uh, Dan Ingalls, I think of as one of the architects of the modern world. Uh, he was one of the original architects of Smalltalk, the object-oriented programming system that's essentially the ancestor of all modern object-oriented languages. Um, he designed the Smalltalk 76 virtual machine, which was the first practical implementation of these ideas. Um, and he's done uh, very fundamental work in bringing object-oriented concepts out through the user interface, uh, the BitBlit graphics primitive, but also the Fabrique programming environment, uh, a lot of contributions to uh, to Squeak and others, and now he's uh, brought uh, many of these things to the world of JavaScript in the browser. So, Dan. Thanks, Mark. Does this work okay if I'm not hovering near the other one? Yeah, it sounds that way. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you about the Lively Kernel, which is a project uh, we're doing at Sun Labs. And uh, it's not just me. There are a number of us doing it. Uh, I'm one of the principal investigators, along with Antero Taivalsari, uh, who's in Finland. Uh, and then uh, we also have a visiting professor in Finland, Tommy McConan, and Christoph Palak, who's uh, here in the audience. Um, he's in Menlo Park with me. And he, uh, you know, anything here that looks like it might be hard to do, most of it's easy, but some of it's not. Um, Christoph has done. He's been great. And then we also have a couple of other collaborators. Uh, Steve Euler, who's here with us. Uh, at, he's at Sun Labs. And uh, Steve knows all about uh, all sorts of things, but uh, among other things, uh, sound. And he's been around a lot with user interface design of layouts. So he's sort of been, been doing this and that. And we look forward to him doing more. Uh, Richard Ortiz, who's helped us with the website some, and, uh, and then we had a couple of interns from Finland also who helped with some of the applications that I'll show. Um, and now, uh, my way of giving a talk is just to give a demo, typically. So uh, let me just jump into that. Um, uh, but I will start with a little sort of bit of history about how this project got going. Uh, it started with a dinner conversation. Uh, I was having dinner with Antero. And we were sort of, Antero had just given us sort of a summary course on web programming. And, uh, and I had been thinking about web programming. And it, we were just sort of, you know, th this pause came. Uh, when we sort of both were saying, there must be a simpler way. You know, how can this be so complicated? The machines are so much better. Um, we knew how to do things fairly simply 30 years ago. Why has it gotten harder? So we started scratching our heads about that, and we went off on several tangents about how to make JavaScript faster or this or that. Um, and uh, eventually things kind of converged down on this basic idea that uh, there is a dynamic language that's out there in every browser. It's JavaScript. And we both, it was in both of our hearts that what you needed was a dynamic language and the, it's a basic graphics library. And that that ought to cover most everything, it's network access to. So, uh, so the kind of uh, approach we adopted is to say, this is kind of uh, uh, the, conventional stack of web programming. It starts out with an operating system that gives you network and graphics, um, a browser that sort of makes that available through the document object model. And here we get into the history of how the web started. Um, and with the document object model and HTML, a text markup language, what a great place to start. Um, and then on top of that, uh, worlds of wiz widgets that got built. And then JavaScript came along kind of uh, later in the game to add some dynamic behavior, so the ability to you know, test for things. Uh, and what, what we're trying to do is a little bit different, which is to take the same, uh, the same substrate uh, and uh, because we, we, you know, what we're starting with is the operating system in the browser. Part of this, what we wanted to do in this project, we'd both had some experience with systems that we did 
all ourselves in a proprietary way. And they were wonderful, but they had trouble going anywhere. So we thought we'd start with what everybody's working with, and then maybe things could go somewhere. And then instead of copying all this sort of complicated world, uh, we just wanted to take JavaScript on the browser and then build the widgets that would be needed for doing most of the sort of you know, mom and pop software on top of this. And that is the stack as we look at it. And some of the other frills that we might want to put, such as the effects of cascading style sheets and stuff, we figured we could do in that environment. So that's the approach. Um, and as you might guess, I'm running the system now. Uh, what you're looking at is a web page. Uh, and uh, I think if, you know, if there's one thing I'd like you to get through all of this is it's not complicated. It's really easy. You know? so, uh, so this entire system is 10,000 lines of code, which seems like a lot, but it's something you, know, you can give to a grad student and he can play around with it and do a useful thing in a day or a week. You know? so, uh, but I'll just kind of take you through a little bit of how it's built. Um, you see here some simple graphical objects on the screen, a rectangle, an ellipse, and so on. And so one of the first, if, if you think of the page that comes off into your computer and starts running, and the, one of the neat things about this system is it never needs to be installed. It just runs when you hit it. Um, one of the first things you might like to do is to be able to take the shapes and pick them up and move them around. And, uh, Another thing I have to, sort of a disclaimer I have to make is that a lot of this is in a primitive state, and some of the features we're using in the browsers are in a primitive state. Um, in the, if I go to the beta version, one of the special beta versions of Safari, then this would have had a nice drop shadow on it. Um, but the, uh, but it, 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 this all runs in standard Safari 3.0. So as I say, you have the, uh, one of the first things you have is the ability to pick objects up, move them around. So you can think of that as uh, you've got your basic graphics library, and then how much does it take to do that? Not much, you know, half a page, something like that. Um, then the next thing you might want to do is to be able to uh, copy objects. So you can do that. Um, and this is, uh, this is pretty simple to do, you know. How hard could it be? Um, and I'll make a couple of these. And then uh, the next thing you might want to do is to be able to edit the objects. So what, what, you, <clears throat> what you're seeing here, so here, uh, if I get near this part of the ellipse, um, it, it springs open a little handle that I can edit things with. Um, so what you're seeing here is along with the code to uh, to move objects around, to copy them, there is a little bit of graphics editing in there, too. Um, but it's done in a very uniform way, so that uh, basically that little handle that came up is just another one of these objects. Um, let me play around here a little bit more. Do that. Something like that. And uh, <clears throat> so once you, once you can do that, you can edit objects. Uh, move them around. Uh, the next thing you might want to do is to be able to compose them. And we have a very simple rule here, which is that if you drop one object on another, and when you let go, the cursor's over the, the, uh, the target, then they stick together. So this is now a compound object. And again, each of these is just, you know, little half page code. Um, probably less when you put them all together. Um, and there are other th things that come with the system. Uh, so here's a polygon. I'll make a copy of that. And it's got uh, mm, the same kind of graphics editing in it. You can pick up the vertices. And uh, the one, it's got one nice thing about it is that you can, you can go in the middle of a line, and you get a different kind of a handle, and that just makes more vertices. And uh, so you can do that. And, uh, and if you move one over a nearby vertex, you can see the handle turns red. Maybe you can't, but it does. And that gets rid of that vertex. So that's uh, just a really bare bones little polygon editor. Um, and we could pick this guy up and drop him there, make this guy happy. 
Um, so, and this is all done. Uh, I'll take you back to a little bit of history. The first version that we did with this used the Canvas graphics model. And we worked with that for a while. But we wanted, if, uh, one of the things we wanted to do was to be able to make a kernel that would work nicely in mobile environments. So we, it was important to us that things be able to arbitrarily scale and rotate. And the Canvas environment did not have that, a good answer for that in the space of text. So, uh, so last summer, we sort of latched on to SVG. And this current version I'm showing you is using SVG. Uh, and uh, and what's, what's nice about that is that then with SVG, you can do, so this whole, whole object is nicely scalable, you know, and, uh, and you can rotate it like that. Um, and uh, so this, and, and, you know, and, and copy. So you've got, <clears throat> basically, it, it's not like what we want to do is have people building frogs, but this is a stand-in for the basic operation of building up complex graphical objects from simple ones and making that simple. And the one other ingredient that I'll show you is uh, at the simple level is you can have objects that have scripts on them that tick. So that's how you get a dynamic object like this star um, and uh, make a copy of it like that. And as you might guess, if you take something and compose it on that, it, it inherits. So, um, <clears throat> and you can, you can have lots of fun with this. So that's, the, I guess, the other message of this talk is that um, all the systems I've worked on, part of the goal was not only to make them simple in general, but to make them fun. And, uh, and this is sort of fun to play with. Um, so if I, I take uh, <clears throat> a copy of this star and drop, if I can drop it on right there on that one, you see it's picking up the rotation relative to the other guy. OK. So, and that's not magic. I mean, you've got a very simple programming language here. It's just set up in an architecture that preserves the generality, right? Um, so now, uh, let me t I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the structure of this world. So this came as a web page. And, uh, and we have ways of linking web pages in this system. But we also have a, a, a way to have linked worlds within a given scope uh, of objects. And that's what I've got here. Um, and this is actually a subworld of another world that I'm going to go out into. And this has some stuff I'll talk to you about later. And I'm going to go in here to another world called Development Tools and just uh, sort of continue the process of building up uh, this graphical world. Um, uh, I guess the first thing I'll show you is that little piece of code up in the upper right, which may be hard to read, so I'll make it a little bigger. Um, <clears throat> and one of the nice thing, things is that the text editor is all written in JavaScript, so it inherits all these properties. Um, and uh, in fact, one of, the, one of the things we often like to play with is, is uh, Let's see, let me get this like that. OK. Um, so here's a little piece of code, and I'll read it to you in case you can't read that. It says, let p be uh, a new pen, set its pen color to red, and then go through a loop from, uh, from 1 to 40, uh, telling the pen to go that distance times 2, and then turn 90 degrees and then draw the resulting lines. So let me move this guy out of the way and come up here. And if I execute that, uh, then I get this figure here. Um, and what's nice is it isn't just scribbles on the screen. It actually created an object that captures those graphics. And you, know, you can get in here and, and mess around with it, too. You know. uh, <clears throat> And, uh, and you, can, you, know, you can make little changes to this. If, if we turn not quite in 90 degrees, but only 89 degrees, then it has this nice sort of precessing quality. And you can have lots of fun playing around with that. But again, this isn't about fun geometric 
Well, it is. It's partly about how easy and fun it is to do little geometric games. But, um, but more importantly, here's a swatch of JavaScript that I've tried out two versions of now You know, in a few seconds. Um, so this could have been a little piece of code that was there doing some piece of screen scraping where I was looking for stock prices. And I, you know, I try it out, change it a bit, try it out. Um, so that's, uh, and the other, the other aspect to this is that from that graphic vocabulary that we started out with, that came with the operating system, that came with the browser, we've now extended it so we can make up objects that hadn't been thought of in the operating system and use them in the system. Let me just have a sip here. Um, so now what I'd like to do is to continue that process of building up and out of the very simple graphics. Um, so uh, here I have, it's sort of a widget test panel, if you will. So there are two things going on here, which is uh, we've built, using very simple little swatches of JavaScript, some conventional widgets. And this test panel also has the property to the, to sort of try out an MVC style model so that a lot of them have common models underneath them. So uh, here's a button, and the one below it is hooked to the same Boolean. Uh, but it's, uh, the one on top is one of these things where it goes when I push, and this one down below uh, just changes when I push. But they're hooked up to the same Boolean. Uh, and here we have a piece of text. Uh, says, hello world. If I select that and say hi and uh, accept that, then you'll see that the other three panels were looking at the same model. Um, this one, uh, however, down here has a continuous update property. So, so, that, so this is just trying out various little text things that have a common model. And you may have noticed the one below is testing the fact of, that these guys have an output that is their current selection. So if I select there, then it gives the selection down below, or it actually will do it dynamically while I'm going along there. Okay. Um, and over here we have a little bit more text, but this text is made into is in the form of a list, and in fact it does have some scripts on it that gives it list-like behavior, and its neighbor is viewing that same model of what the selection is. Uh, and down here we have some rectangles that are like those rectangles I showed you in the first screen, um, but they've been put together with a little bit more scripting so to work as a kind of a slider. And you can see they've been hooked to this text panel up above. And it's been done bidirectionally. So if I change that to 0.8, then it jumps over that way. And you might guess that what this one here is doing is giving me the extent of the slider. So if I change that to uh, 0.3, then it changes that way. Uh, and what else? Well, this one's got a little piece of generality in its code, nothing earth-shaking, but you can see that it works horizontally and vertically as well. Okay? So, uh, so now we're at the point that we could actually start to do some useful software. Remember, there's nothing native here. All this is is the graphics that came with the browser and JavaScript. But uh, I think you can see that if you take those things we built and put them together, uh, here's that slider uh, doing service as a scroll bar. Here's that list showing a list of items um, that you can select. Um, and what we have here is actually a class browser looking at the classes in the system that's running. Um, so, for instance, uh, let, me, let me go get us uh, a little application that we can be looking at while we're looking at the code. I'm going to go back to that outer world. Uh, I'm going to pick this clock up. And uh, so here we've got drag and drop of a live ticking object. And uh, we'll now drag it through this wormhole. Um, so now we're looking at the clock, and here in the list is the code for the clock. And um, like everything else, it's pretty simple. Uh, it's got uh, 
Um, it's got a little constructor thing, an initialization. Most of the work here is, uh, is in this make face routine. Uh, it doesn't mean make a bad face, it means draw the, the numerals. And you can see it's sort of, most of it is here in this loop that goes from one to 12, putting out the numerals. Uh, and it will either do Roman or, or uh, regular Latin numerals. So that's all that code there. This creates uh, three hands called hours, minutes, and seconds, not surprisingly. So that's all that code. Um, and then if you look at this thing called start stepping script, every uh, object in this system, when it's dropped in the, into the world, uh, get sent this message, start stepping scripts, so that if it wants to do stepping behavior, it gets, uh, it gets given a kickstart. And this one, you can see it says, uh, send, the, send the start stepping message with a parameter of 1,000 milliseconds and the procedure set hands, um, the method set hands. So if I look at that code, you'll see that this is what it does on every second tick. Um, it gets the current date, and it computes the second, the minute, and so on. And then down here, remember these hours, minutes, and seconds, those are the names of the hands. Um, so if you take a look at the seconds, it says uh, set the seconds, uh, excuse me, uh, tell the seconds to set its rotation to the current second value divided by 60 times 2 pi. Looks right, right? Um, and we could actually, uh, we could go in here and uh, change that to be minus 2 pi just to be devilish and accept it. And now we've got a clock that runs backwards, okay? Um, so that's just to indicate that everything that's here is here in a live way. Um, and that applies to the clock or to the actual parts of the system if you wish. Um, and, and again, since this object itself uh, is all, you know, it's all made in using these same uh, components, it can be scaled and rotated arbitrarily. Um, and it just, uh, it keeps on working. So in fact, and I can go back and uh, unfix that. So we're back running that way. Uh, so, uh, so that's the basic way that we start out with a simple web page that just allows you to you know, move graphics around, um, add a few scripts, build up some widgets, and pretty soon you're into the space of integrated development environments. Um, and now what I'll do is to show you just a few things that we've, uh, that we've built in, the, in this system. Uh, here's, uh, Uh, here's a window. One of the things I neglected to show you, we have a sort of a, uh, I'll go back to where we were just so you get a sense of it. Um, you notice things look pretty primitive in this world. Uh, all the shapes are very rectangular. Um, you, can, uh, you, can, you can come up to any object and ask to view its style. So I can come up to this uh, widget test panel and view its style. And I could go and uh, uh, move this slider over and round its corners like that. And I might set its border width to be, oh, a little bit more. And I might give it a border color that's sort of more consonant with this background. And just to make it look sort of modern, you know, we could uh, make it look translucent so that now when you pick it up and drag it around it, you know, one of those nice controls. Um, so here again, it's the system working on itself and allowing you to make changes like that. And, uh, and I guess you could even take, uh, um, let's see here. Uh, look at the style of the style panel. and said it's, uh, okay. So you have that kind of control over everything. Um, 
And then, uh, and we sort of built into this a very primitive uh, sort of facility for, I'm going to get rid of that, it's kind of, well, I'll leave it there for a minute, because just to make a point. Um, <clears throat> but we've put, it got a sort of a simple facility that's along the lines of cascading style sheets, which allows you to, uh, to specify style um, in an inherited way. So if I go down here and say, choose display theme, uh, the theme that was in this window was primitive, and that's why everything's very rectangular. Um, I, I'll choose the lively one, which is our default. And you see, all of a sudden, all of the windows you know, got their title bars rounded, and, uh, and the scroll bars got a slightly different fill, and the title bars got a gradient fill. So there's that kind of control there. Um, it's all pretty simple to do. So now I'll go back to where I was. And you can see that this is in that style, these windows are. And, uh, and these are just simple little applet applets that you might want to make. Uh, here's one that shows the current graph of the stock market in it. And then it's got RSS feeds for Dow Jones and for NASDAQ and you know the price of your favorite stocks and stuff like that. Um, and uh, got a very simple little uh, sort of 3D-ish little demo here. Um, we've got uh, <clears throat> no software system is uh, complete if it can't do asteroids. You know. um, and I won't take time with that, but uh, that's how that works. Here's a little weather widget. Um, for San Francisco, it's got San Francisco, Tempore, Finland. You can guess why that's there, and we can see what the weather's like there. Uh, I'm glad we're, we're where we are. Um, uh, and let me, I'll show you a couple, a couple of other applications done. Here's a, uh, a Google Maps sort of application there. And you can scroll around. Um, and uh, here's another RSS feed guy where, where now you can look at the contents below each of these. Um, but you can see that these are all made up of those simple primitive uh, widgets uh, that were built so simply. Uh, they've got a little, a, uh, here's a little movie player. Mm. Yeah. This is something about some guy who uh, strapped uh, leaf blowers to a bicycle to make them. And uh, let's see what else we got here. Um, this is, uh, I don't know if, if you know the, uh, the Canvas scape demo, uh, but this is, a, uh, here we've got that running in this system. And uh, you can see these things all sort of run together. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, we have work to do on the performance still, uh, but uh, <clears throat> as near as we can tell, a lot of the performance is going into the API. I'll come back and talk more about this between the underlying system and the graphics. Um, so uh, here in this one, uh, I think I can, t oh yeah, that's right. This is a funny little aspect of this. Don't be alarmed. Um, so here you can move around in this uh, little 3D space. Um, and coming back here, uh, so those are a bunch of the sort of simple applications. And then I did one application that's more complicated than the others in terms of its sort of uh, actual you know, programming model, if you will. So this is a model of, uh, of a gasoline engine. Um, and you can see it sort of changes color depending on whether it's uh, taking in or compressing the gas and it turns yellow and it explodes and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> and this is set up to be uh, any number of cylinders also, so you can do this. Um, and part of the, uh, this, this was a piece of tutorial software that I wanted to do for a long time because there's a funny thing about building a radial engine um, which is that, uh, first of all, it doesn't, it doesn't run smoothly if you do the sort of simplest thing. I'll stop this and step it through. Um, so uh, we've got 
Um, at the top is where it's compressing. It's about to fire. And then the next one is to the right of it. That was 90 degrees. The next one below, you know, and then here. And then because it's a four-cycle engine, the whole thing just idles for a whole revolution. So you wouldn't want to build one like that unless you like vibrations in your airplane. Um, but even there, uh, so we'll change to an, uh, to an alternate firing order um, and, and step it now. So now you'll see the one on the right is about to go. And then the one on the left, 180 degrees later. But now it's going to fire the one at the top just 90 degrees later. And so we've got, uh, we've got an irregularity there. And it turns out that if you build a radial engine using a four-cycle engine, the only way you can make it run smoothly is to have an odd number of cylinders. Okay. So if you now step this through, um, you'll see the familiar five-pointed star. It's going to go off on the uh, upper right, and then the lower left, and then the top, and then the lower right. So this is a demonstration of that. And uh, if you look at any radial engine in an airplane, you'll find that it has an odd number of cylinders. Um, and it's set up for, you know, you can choose seven uh, and, uh, or nine, any of those. Um, so that's, uh, that's where I wanted to take uh, with the demo. Um, I think what I'll do is to just come out and talk a little bit about the system and then open it up for questions. Uh, so let me uh, come out here. And move on there. So some statistics about it. As I said, it's about 10,000 lines of code. Um, about 300K of that is in the kernel, which is the graphics architecture and the widgets that I've showed you. Um, and this is 300K um, uncompressed and with comments. Okay, so it's something like you know a third of that if you compress it and, and so on. There's another uh, uh, another hundred and K, another hundred K there of kind of adaptation and workarounds, and so an example of workarounds. Well, let me uh, digress for a minute here. It's very interesting doing this project because um, you can sort of tell that people haven't done this before um, because uh, the programming language is set up to be a scripting language. Um, so it's got lots of features that make it better for scripting, like sort of forgiving many errors. Um, but it makes it much worse for programming because you've got the errors. And the problem is you find out about them about three, you know, three cycles later when it's harder to debug. Um, and with the graphics, we found that uh, you know, lots, lots of the graphics systems are fairly solid, except that um, if you want to, for instance, lay out text, um, typically, that's done elsewhere on some server before squirting out HTML. Um, and a lot of these systems, both in, uh, both in the Canvas model and the SVG model, if you ask them for the geometries of the text, it's hard to get that, and it's often wrong. So, so along with this adaptation, which is sort of the API, that gets us through the DOM to the graphics calls are some workarounds. So for instance, Christoph had to do lots of work to get in and find out from, from through the DOM the real measurement of these characters because SVG wasn't giving it to us accurately in this system or that. Now those are things that will all get worked out. Um, it's, you know, there are parts of the browser graphics and, and language systems that are solid because they've been used for 10 years. And these are parts of them that haven't really been used until now. And they'll get solid. Um, and then there's another 120K of sort of uh, JavaScript extras. This includes uh, uh, Doug Crockford's prototype stuff and a, and a little bit of other uh, kind of structuring uh, mechanism. <clears throat> so uh, where we're going, um, you can see things are still in a fairly primitive state, um, but they're going forward. It's, uh, um, it's, 
it's gratifying to see how much he can already do in a system that's so simple. Um, we want to complete the IDE that we've got. Uh, so we have in there the ability to do, uh, you saw, well, you didn't see it all, but um, there's an inspector that lets you inspect objects. And, uh, and we've got some measurement uh, facilities. I'll, sh I'll show that to you later on. Um, and we've actually got, one of the nice things about JavaScript is it is pretty general. And so, for instance, you can, uh, you can just tell the system to wrap every function. Well, let's see. As it normally comes to you, you can't inspect the stack. But what you can do is wrap every procedure that puts the stack on a stack. Um, and then when you, when you get an error, you can look at what you created. So, uh, so um, it takes a lot to keep us down, I guess is one way of saying that. Um, we want to hook, that browser that I showed you was decompiling code. So that, that was simple to do. What we want to do is to hook it up to our real code repository uh, using WebDAV. And we have, there is WebDAV code in here for doing that. Uh, and at that point, um, when we make changes, then you know, it'll actually be in our repository and we'll be advancing the system with every little change. That's where we want it to be. Um, we had an earlier version of the system that was collaborative in the sense, I don't know if you noticed during the demo, uh, and when we go back there, you'll, you'll probably always be looking at it now, um, this little sort of fly following my cursor. That was the actual hand object uh, that's a part of the morphic graphics uh, model. And there can be several of those. Uh, and in an earlier version of this system that we did on top of Java 2D, uh, Christoph actually got a whole synchronization mechanism going so that you could have multiple people working in the same world using a comment style uh, update. And so we're, uh, you know, now that we've got this all working with SVG, uh, we're going to go back and revive that so that, you can ha so that you could really do a sort of a collaborative whiteboard this way and other things like that. Um, and then the, the last sort of point I want to make about this environment, and it's, it's got to do with how small it is also, um, which is that uh, whenever you build a self-supporting system, uh, the neat thing is that in, in, you know, in its little universe, that's all there is. So if you want to do some experiments, like if you want to try to put this in 3D, you have nothing more that you have to work on than, than the code that's there. Uh, and so we want to we want to play around with that. Um, we're also interested in looking at smaller, faster JavaScripts, smaller, faster SVG libraries, and especially the interface between them. So if any of this looked a little logy to you, it does to me. Um, a lot of the problem has to do with the fact that the SVG that you get given in a browser is given to you through the DOM interface. Um, and for an example, every time you, you make any call that has a color in it, uh, we've got a perfectly good RGB color object sitting out in our system. Um, to go through the DOM interface, the, the red, green, and blue all have to get converted to a text string, which then gets parsed and taken apart on the other side of the interface. This is not the way you do fast graphics. Um, but it shouldn't be hard to do some experiments to get around that. Um, and, uh, and then, again, the opportunity with a system like this is to, you know, uh, along with experimenting with, you know, other, other languages or whatever, um, there's, uh, and this, this relates specifically to the Kaha project here, it's fairly easy to take a system like this and try it all out in some variant, say, some variant of JavaScript. And the nice thing is that if you can just make it work, then you know that sort of all of this stuff will come along with it as soon as you get it working. So, uh, so that's something that we're looking forward to exploring. And both uh, <coughs> Mark and I have been talking around this, except we've both been busy with other things for the last month. Um, I wanted to show uh, one thing just uh, actually, I think I'll open it, open it up for questions. And if people want to go into some of the ID issues, I can show you a bit of that. So that's the end of the formal presentation. Yeah. This, this looks terrific. 
with, with power uh, comes responsibility, and in particular with programmability, there's a class of uh, things that malicious people can do with mobile code. Uh, and I wonder if you have any thoughts about uh, what's different in this system from all other mobile code, mobile code systems. So uh, <laughs> it's, it's no different in, in sort of all of the downsides and the upsides. Uh, and that's, uh, so there are various answers to that. Um, Mark is working on an important one, which is how to really uh, organize your universe in terms of capabilities so that, uh, so that you can't do damage unless you're supposed to be able to do damage. Um, the, the other thing you can do is you can divide it up and, and allow somebody to work in this lively world, but only share things that are not lively in dangerous ways. Um, but there's, there's no magic here in that regard. Yeah. Hey, um, I'm a big fan of your work with Smalltalk and BitBlit and this, so it's great to, to get to be here. Um, I'm with the Google Gears team, uh -huh. and one of our goals is to augment current web browsers with new capabilities. So very interested to know what kinds of facilities would make your software more you know, easier to build faster along those lines to, to be Yeah, so games. we've, um, I can see lots of overlaps there. Um, uh, the, uh, I guess the first one that occurs to me is that uh, I had a lot of fun in a former lifetime doing this system called Fabric, which is uh, it's a visual programming language in which you have objects on the screen and you hook them up just like in Google Gears, except that it had a different model. Um, oh, oh it, I should just make sure. I mean, are you aware of, of what Gears is? Just it's it's uh, it's just um, plugs new features into web browsers mm -hmm. like offline access and yep. so it's not visual. Okay, it's, okay, yeah, so I guess I was thinking of the interface on top of it, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, so that would be a nice opportunity. So if we wanted to play with uh, a better, a, a sort of more appropriate graphics model, mm -hmm. it'd be a great way to do that, and also alternative JavaScript engines. Um, one of the things I didn't talk about is, from our experience working with JavaScript, it would appear that you could have a considerably simpler language that probably could be executed quite a bit faster and still have very much the same feel. So yeah, I think that would be a lot of fun. And I don't know if that's the kind of thing that you're getting at in that way. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Cool, I've, I've only dabbled with uh, Squeak and I guess that's how I've kind of seen how uh, you know, all these different ideas. It looks, looks very much like that. And also, I know that Smalltalk was kind of the originator of unit testing, the unit te S, S talk, mm -hmm. um, or S unit. I was curious, uh, is there a lively kernel unit, or how do you test it, is basically my question. Um, do you have automated testing? <clears throat> there probably should be, and we sort of rushed into it without having done a lot of that. Um, so that's an opportunity that sits there for some of the people who want to come along and work on the project. Was it, is there like a technical, uh, like, oh shoot, we have to solve this other problem before we tackle that, or is it just limited time and just haven't gotten to it yet? Uh, I think it's sort of the, the background of the participants and the, uh, and the headlong rush. Um, but, uh, and that's not to say that you can't go fast the other way, but anyway, that's, that's the way it currently is. Um, we sh I think, I see that as being you know, another component when we, when we get the, uh, the repository online is to get some of those uh, facilities in there soon. Cool, thanks. Yeah. So Currently, just to add one, one little uh, postscript to that, uh, you asked how do you know that things are working. Um, one thing about systems like this and like Squeak, and, and, uh, which is to the extent that they are still a small kernel, uh, you find out immediately if something doesn't work because everything's using everything all the time. Yeah. Hey, another question. Um, so Smalltalk, Squeak, and this have really similar sort of uh, user models and user interface. Um, and they've had difficulty gaining adoption. Are there any sort of lessons learned about usability and, and uh, how to get these kinds of systems in the hands of more mainstream users? Yeah, I think, uh, well, there are, there's the perennial uh, 
push and pull between uh, what it's, it, native widgets and, and, uh, and self-supporting systems. So in this system, it's all written in the lively kernel itself. The upside is if you put it on any machine, it's going to behave the same. And that's the, it, this is also true of small talk systems and so on. Um, the downside is that one of your customers may really like his Windows that he's got r running on his system, and he wants it all to look that way. Um, and moreover, when he upgrades to his new operating system, he wants to inherit all those new properties. So the way this has been handled typically in the past is that um, somebody takes a good bit of care to establish a layer over the user interface that, that has uh, implementations that are self-supported and small uh, on the one hand like this, and, and there's another implementation that you can use alternatively that goes to native Windows. And then you know, some work is done at the boundary to make sure it's all compatible. Um, so that, that lesson has been learned a while ago. What you see here is just the self-supporting system all written in itself, just because that was, you know, we're on a proof of concept role here, and we wanted to get that working. But that is a piece of work that needs to follow here if we want to see general adoption, I'm sure. Yeah. An earlier Sun project was something called NEWS, the Network Extensible Windowing System. Mm -hmm. And one of its facilities was the ability to uh, partition an application across multiple machines. So you could have uh, something running, doing some graphics work on your desktop, but doing some compute work on a remote machine. And to, to some extent, how you partitioned it was negotiable according to your network connection speed and so on and so forth. And I wonder if you've thought at all, you, you mentioned having collaborative desktops, but I wonder if you thought at all about taking things and partitioning them across uh, multiple systems in that way. Uh, the answer is that the topic of news has come up, uh, and Christoph was particularly interested in that. Do you want to say any words about that? So I wish I had something more specific to say. We're definitely interested in having the ability to move computation between the client and the server, and uh, assuming that we both uh, both ends run the same uh, this, the same uh, uh, programming language that's already going to be better than news, since we don't have to decide between postscript and uh, yeah, C or whatever. So yes, it's definitely in the news. It's, uh, 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 it seems like uh, people want to run uh, uh, JavaScript-based uh, 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 application servers. There's one, there's one, one uh, little project of Sun that was also a bit splash yesterday or days ago. Tana came out with, with, with the JavaScript based application uh, server. So uh, it's definitely in the works. If we, if we have a compatible architecture, we will definitely lower in the uh, sort of, uh, mismatch between what's going on in the server and the client. Yeah. Yeah. So th this sort of system where the UI, you can drag and drop stuff and you do visual things, it's, it's very fun for demo sort of thing, in my opinion. But there is the, the perennial problem with the, you know, with the difference between more of a declarative system like HTML is from a programmatic and even more to the extreme from a visually driven programmatic uh, language where, you know, the system has very little information about what things actually are rather than other than what the programmer decided to put as very specific things in there. Do you have thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, so you're right about that. And uh, the, the ways I've dealt with that in the past is that um, you complete a system like this by allowing the objects to essentially print the kind of declarative specification that has that they've been built to be um, for people who want to work in that textual space or get programmatic control over it, um, and you should also be able to build things in the system that same way. So I look at it as kind of um, another piece of you know this is a, a a drag and drop GUI builder. There should be another piece there that lets you specify a window. Uh, textually, if you want to. But even that wouldn't give you like 
sort of declare like for example if you wanted to go back to your demo and use it without touching the mouse you wouldn't be able possibly to do that uh, because the system has no real concept between the difference of what is a window from what is a bar slider or something else it, it doesn't really know what things are other than them being lines and being drawn on the screen and being SVG objects there, maybe tied to code. You can't, you, in a web page, you would be able to say, yes, this is a heading, this is a footer, this is a text field, which is different from a combo box. And none of these things is built in any system that is non-declarative that, that I have really seen. And I. Well, yeah, so this is true about the parts that you just put together uh, with drag and drop. You're right about that. If you look at the objects that are in the widget set that I showed, you'll find that there is semantics there. So, you know, a scroll, you know, a scroll pane knows that it has a scroll bar and, and a clipping frame and, and all that other stuff. Um, I don't know how to answer you, you know, sort of briefly, except I think you need both aspects. And, and if somebody tries to build something doing nothing but drag and drop, you're right, they won't have that other semantic base. It's just like programming by example. If somebody deletes a file, um, they don't, there isn't anything anywhere that recorded why they deleted that file. You know, that, it, that it, the reason they did it was that its name began with this and they want to get rid of all of those. So you've got the same kind of comparison there before the drag, between the drag and drop construction and the declarative model as you do between you know, one-off actions in, uh, on the screen and the sort of programming by example field. But yeah, thanks. So um, it sounded earlier when you were asked about adoption that you suggested that the reason why we hadn't seen more small talk squeak adoption was that the windows didn't look like the operating system. And I'm really just not buying that, right? Like, We've had small talk, we've had squeak for a really long time, and these are frequently shown up as like, oh, look, it's a great prototype of what? Like, what's, what's the business model or what's the development model? Like, you've got some buttons, you push them, they go beep. That's great. But um, in a deployed application, I certainly don't want people to be able to arbitrarily interact with or browse the code. Um, and, like, I would really like to see some kind of like, what is it you hope people build? Other than, like, saying, I hope people build, it's perfectly legitimate in educational environments or in whiteboarding environments. Do you see this as being useful beyond that? Because I really just don't see the model that you're replicating, as with the earlier question about adoption, mm -hmm. having ever really made it. Okay. So uh, can you see any analogy between this sort of environment and mashups? I think that this sort of environment is perhaps a bit too um, locally fluid, right? You don't have a strong definition of what these APIs are. You can, you're strongly encouraged to just change them whenever you want. Um, our code browser that you showed us uh, doesn't have versioning, um, right? Like, I don't know, like, the local person could knock something together, but then to build something on top of that, like, Am I going to have persistence? Am I going to have that old version continue to work? I don't know. Like the, the basic. I think you're getting jammed. I mean, the versioning and uh, the ability to publish static APIs and other things that I, I really need to do mashups yep. seem to be missing from this system. And they seem to be missing from Squeak um, and the systems that this system strongly resembles. Well, let's see. So I don't want to get into a long thing about that, but you're absolutely right that you want all of those good things in an environment like this. And this is a proof of concept one that is still sparse in those facilities. But, uh, but what's the proof of concept of? Like, what's the final model? What would that look like? Uh, that you. Um, that you can. Ex that you can build simple objects simply uh, you know, using, using code right off a web page with no installation. 
and then save those for other people to use. You know, it's a, you know, imagine yourself sitting at a bus stop and having this idea and reaching down to your cell phone and doing this kind of stuff. And one of the things I didn't show is we can write web pages straight out of this. Um, and, uh, and then you, you, uh, you, know, you text your friend the link to it or send it live that way. So basically making simple things simple. And then, there's, uh, and then there's the whole area of being able to, you know, on the fly in a very small system, uh, develop stuff, change it, uh, basically experiment. It's a prototyping environment with all of those uh, strengths and weaknesses. So you're, you're saying that this is a prototype of a prototyping environment and that it's not designed to ever go beyond that? I'm not going to limit it. Okay. You can limit it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, two questions. Um, how is the state serialized? And then um, what would something like a social application like MySpace look like inside of this environment? OK, good question. I'm going to turn that over to Christoph. And it'd be nice if we, is there a microphone he could take? Um, th the basic answer is XML. But uh... we are based on the Why don't you come up here? Yes. That'd be good. Plus, then our uh, TV audience can see. So in our current form, uh, we are based on SVG, which, which happens to already have a, a, a serialization format. And we essentially extend it uh, with the bits of information we need. Um, and we use the, the, the platform as much as we can uh, to do the hard work for us. Um, and it's true, not every object that you cr can create dynamically from the, from the IDE will be automatically uh, uh, serializable. But, uh, so, yes? So just to understand, so you, so you serialize into an SVG document with inline script blocks? Uh, that are the Yeah, actions are defined as scripts. Uh, there is, uh, 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 actions are defined as, uh, as blobs of, uh, of of, uh, of uh, uh, code, um, you can you can define a lot of sort of uh, when events are triggered and what what which which function or which which uh, already predefined piece of code is uh, is triggered in response to what event without actually serializing serializing code as such, right? And do worlds become serialized into separate documents with a link relationship? Um, you can do both. You can okay. have. Uh, nested worlds that happen to be just uh, branches of the XML tree, or I can just write them out, and, and the system will add the, uh, enough metadata so that uh, it acts as a, uh, as a real web page. Cool. Thanks. Oh, and then uh, what, what would MySpace look like inside of this? Uh, well, prettier, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, not, not the particular visual look, but so social oriented applications, multiple users, right? Well, web there is, webby stuff. Well, there is, there is so many ways of of doing it. It's only a platform. You can certainly imagine if we if we get if we get the uh, the the, the uh, live collaboration working, we we could definitely take it a step further. If anyone wants to have live collaboration, or, uh, where several people are are you know co creating a, a page. We, we can potentially do, do it. We actually showed how to do it in the previous version. You can imagine uh, a, a, um, a system where every, every world is, uh, is, is someone's private page. People can create them, delete them uh, uh, at will, and, and link, link to each other. Um, we, can, we have both the possibility of having several, uh, several worlds living inside a, uh, a, a common runtime. But we can also have separate worlds existing out, uh, in, in, in uh, different runtimes with different uh, 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 JavaScript uh, scoping uh, uh, mechanisms. Great. I don't know if that's answer. That's good, yeah. Um, th yeah. This is related to the uh, earlier question. Um, so can you, uh, perhaps one thing I see when I um, see a system like this is a proliferation of very rich affordances that an average end user might be confused by, 
but at the same time, which are very useful for someone who is more of a programmer. So can you imagine a principled manner in which uh, the system might choose to attenuate or display the affordances depending on, let's say, the world that an object was living in. If you drag an object into a developer world, you see a lot of affordances that when you go into sort of a consumer world are more attenuated and then it becomes more easy to use in the manner provided and not programmable as much. Certainly. Um, and this, you know, this isn't our particular strength. I mean, we could work on this. Um, but as, for instance, there are controls on every object as to whether it can be dragged and dropped uh, on whether it will show its handles. And you can have those kind of controls in the world as well. Um, but we haven't taken time. It, this, you know, this is not ready for random users uh, to play with. And that's why you see all that happening. Um, and yes, it needs principles applied. <laughs> OK, well, I think this is a good place to end the formal presentation. And uh, folks are welcome to come up and chat more.